7 verse 4 but as I've been doing all four verses 1 through 4 go together so I will read all four verses he was praying in a certain place and when he finished one of his disciples said to him Lord teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples he said to them whenever you pray say father your name be honored as holy your kingdom come give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves also forgive everyone in debt to us and do not bring us into temptation well last week we looked at verse 3 which is give us each our daily bread and this verse serves as a dividing line in this model prayer. See, in these four verses, there are two distinct divisions or parts. And so the first part we'll review, Father, your name be honored as holy, your kingdom come, and over in, in Matthew's gospel, it adds your will be done and those three things put the focus squarely on God and what Jesus is telling us when we begin to pray this must be our beginning point and after this there are three more requests which focus on what each human or mankind needs one daily bread forgiveness of sins and leading us away or staying away from temptation see once we have the right focus on God those other things will begin to fall into place and here again we are asking for God to supply our needs bread of course is very important but there are other needs mentioned in this prayer as well and that's what we're looking at here at verse 4 and forgive us our sins for we ourselves also forgive everyone in debt to us and do not bring us into temptation and I hope as you read that verse as you hear that verse that you feel God's love and compassion and most of all, his grace. See, verse 4 is clearly telling us that we need something more than bread in our lives. We are a body, soul, and spirit. And so this verse, or these verses, are addressing both the physical and the spiritual needs that we have, especially the need for forgiveness. <coughs> Forgive us our sins. As verse 4 begins, God is the forgiver of sins. We all need forgiveness and God is ready to grant it but there is a requirement on our part we must be willing to ask for and receive forgiveness now I'm going to mention universalism which is a, a belief or a doctrine or a theology that says all the belief that Christ died for all so all will be forgiven by Christ's work and universalism says all will be restored to a right relationship with God because of Jesus and so we don't need forgiveness and that there is no hell and there is no eternal punishment and this verse is the antidote to universalism. Clearly Jesus says we must ask for forgiveness 
for our sins, that we must accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. And why is that important? Well, sitting in a, a church pew or attending church services does not mean that you are forgiven, nor does it make you a Christian. Sitting in a garage does not make you a car. Sitting in McDonald's does not make you a hamburger. There is something required or something needed when you go into McDonald's. There's something that just being in a garage is not going to meet what you need. So what is your reason for attending church? Look at verse 4, and part of the reason is forgiveness. See, forgiveness is what a great thing that God has done for us. Forgiveness and reconciliation to God are the right steps on the path to a right relationship with God. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve sinned, and so all of us were born sinners. And each one of us has a sin nature. And if you don't believe that, then just look around at what people do to each other. It's there. The sin nature is there. And because of sin, Adam and Eve were separated from God, and they were afraid of God. And they faced the same need to be reconciled to God. And because we hurt others in our daily living, we need forgiveness. Not only from God, but from each other. And so we can break verse 4 down into three parts. A, B, and C. A, and forgive us our sins. B, for we ourselves also forgive everyone in debt to us or in sin to us. And C, do not bring us into temptation. Now part A of this verse cannot stand alone without part B. Though many people would like to think so, and many people try to live that way, with part B being disconnected from part A, it cannot be so as a Christian. If God forgives us, and we, or we ask God to forgive us, and of course we know that he does forgive us. So we have been forgiven by God if we ask for it. And we in turn must forgive those in debt or in sin to us. Why? Because we are in debt to God. And God, God freely forgives our debt. So then we have the obligation to forgive or remove the debt we have towards others. That's why part A and part B are connected together. And there is a twofold sense of obligation here. 
It's unspoken, but it's strongly implied. If we don't forgive, God will not forgive us. Yet we freely ask and claim God's forgiveness. Yet, despite being shown God's grace and mercy, we will not show forgiveness to those who have hurt us or who have wronged us, who have sinned against us, who have damaged us, who have acted evilly towards us. No matter what they did, then they have a debt. See, we have a debt outstanding towards those that have hurt us or used us or wronged us or damaged us. And the only solution is to forgive as God forgives us. Verse 4 is literally saying in the Greek, who is indebted to us? In other words, forgive us our sins, God's part, for we ourselves also forgive everyone in debt to us. Or literally, who is indebted to us. And now this is an idiom. It's a figurative meaning because of common usage, and it differs from the literal usage. Though it can have, an idiom can have both a literal and a figurative meaning, we usually, when we use an idiom, we use it in a figurative sense. Now, not to bring you back to English class. I think we're already almost there. But, you know, your English class from school, we use idioms every day. We, we usually don't call them that and we don't always recognize them as that. But we use idioms every day and understand the figurative usage. For example, she's pulling your leg. Somebody's tricking you. Drop them a line, meaning write somebody a note. Nowadays, the kids would say, text me, or send me some digits. Not your finger digits, but numbers. You should keep an eye out for that. I can't keep my head above water. It's raining cats and dogs. How many of you have ever said that idiom? It's raining cats and dogs out there. I tried to come up with one for, for snow, but I couldn't, I couldn't think of one off the top of my head. You spilled the beans. In other words, you gave away a secret. And this one, sort of my favorite, he kicked the bucket. <laughs> of course, now, you know, we have a, another idi idiom that goes with that. Everybody has their, their bucket list of things they want to accomplish before they, they die. But he kicked the bucket. Well, the idiom in the Aramaic was to call sin a debt. So when we speak of forgive everyone in debt to us, we are talking about something due. Morally a, a fault or a mistake or an injury against us, a, a debt. And literally when we pray, 
Forgive us our sins. We are asking God to send them away. To remember them no more. And then we need to forgive all of those who quote unquote owe us. No matter what they may have done to us. So it, it stands to reason we have done wrong against God both knowingly and unknowingly. And we know that people have done wrong against us both knowingly and unknowingly. And so, so, so Luke writes, forgive us our sins to make it clear to the reader who may not be familiar with the idiom just as a non-English speaker would have trouble understanding the idioms that I spoke about earlier. And there is nothing simple or easy here. It just says we are to forgive. Why? Because God forgives us our sins. You, you must, you must, you must do this. It's not a one-way street. It's not, but pastor, you don't know what so-and-so or what this person has done to me. You don't know how they've hurt me. You don't know what it is they've done. But you know what? God knows. Jesus knows. And Jesus paid the ultimate price so that we all could be forgiven. All we need to do is have our attitude, our heart match God's actions. Otherwise, we'll never be free of that debt if we do not forgive. See, we are forgiven not because we forgive others. We are forgiven because of God's grace and Jesus' work on the cross. Now, I said part A and part B, God forgives us, so we have the obligation to forgive others, is implied in verse 4. But it's very clear in other parts of the Bible. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive Others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Mark chapter 11, verse 25. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. See, we need to be ready to forgive. We need to be willing to forgive. Why? Because if we don't, we risk, miss, we risk missing God's heavenly forgiveness. And then we get to the last part of the verse. And do not bring us into temptation. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And Luke chapter 4, verse 13, when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. And Luke 22, verse 40, 
There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. And then verse 46, why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. Jesus faced temptation and each one of us will face temptation. It's something that each of us faces as we live our daily lives. You know, it's been said the only time a man doesn't notice a beautiful woman is when he's dead. Sorry, ladies, but that is part of being a man. It's always a temptation to notice a woman. And the temptation is not sin, but the lusting, the taking, the third, the second, the third, the fourth look is moving beyond the temptation. Jesus was tempted. We will be tempted. In the Old Testament, God put the Israelites into tests or temptations. And in the New Testament, temptation is identical to or equal with trials. And God sometimes allows us to go through them. Trials, temptations. There was a boy who grew up in a small town that was so small the local school bus was a Toyota painted yellow. And he went out and he went shopping at the town's drugstore. And he told the pharmacist that he wanted three boxes of chocolate. He wanted the one pound, he wanted the three pound, and he wanted the five pound box of candy. And he wanted them gift wrapped. And so the druggist told them okay and, and gave them to the girl behind the counter for her to gift wrap them. And when the candy was ready and the boy was paying for it, he says, you know, we don't get many requests like this. And I'm, I'm kind of curious what, what you are planning to do with the candy. And the boy said, well, yeah, I, I'm so excited about my plans, I'll, I'll tell you. He says, I have a date tonight with the cutest girl in town. And I'm going to go to her house and we're going to have dinner. And after dinner, we're going to go sit out on the porch on the swing. And if she lets me hold her hand, I'm going to give her the one, the one pound box of chocolate. And if she lets me put my arm around her shoulder... I'm going to give her the three-pound box of chocolate. And if she lets me kiss her, I'm going to give her the five-pound box of chocolate. So the boy leaves, and he arrives that evening at the girl's house. They sit down for dinner, and the father asks the boy to say grace, to pray for the meal. And so the boy bows his head and he prays and he prays and he prayed around the world once and he prayed around the world twice and he keeps on praying and finally he, he finishes the prayer and he looks up and the girl says, I didn't know you were so religious. And the boy said, I didn't know your father was the pharmacist. <laughs> God doesn't tempt us. See, we do all right on our own. You know, generally when there's temptation, we walk right into it with both eyes open. You know, God doesn't dangle a cute girl in front of us. He doesn't give us boxes of chocolate. He doesn't give us, he doesn't give us money. He doesn't give us things that, that we like and Put something that's quick and easy in front of us and say, go for it. See, we make up our minds. We make our own choices. 
And if they happen to follow God's will or God's will, word, then we ask God to bless what we are about to do or what we are doing. But oftentimes the temptation comes and we don't care. We just keep going right into it and we get in trouble and we suffer the consequences and we have the hurt from it and we have the debt or the sin from it. So Luke says to believers, pray, do not bring us into temptation. See, our prayer, our concern right here is the application. We are asking God to keep us from being unaware or not recognizing that we are about to fall into sin because we are yielding to temptation. See, the worst thing is being in sin and not being aware of it or not addressing it. Praying this first, lead us not into temptation, is the first and best step to avoiding to being aware and to be leaving temptation. So when we pray, we are praying to God, asking him to keep us from entering or being tempted by things that might hurt us or harm us or harm others. In other words, we pray that we will not yield to temptation, that we will not give into it. You know, too many people live their lives with the grass is greener on the other side of the fence philosophy. But remember this. The grass is always greener over the septic tank too, but you really don't want to go there for a picnic. The same thing applies to temptation. It looks good, it sounds good, but you really don't want to go there because it has consequences and it has a cost that you probably cannot pay and do not want to pay. So you're better off not going there in the first place. If when we pray, we focus on God, and focus on the things we need, and we strive for spiritual perfection and ask for God's forgiveness, not just once, but as John Wesley said, we continually ask for forgiveness, because believe me, I know I need it. We need to continually ask for forgiveness. Ask for God's protection and guidance then we will be praying as God would have us pray. And we will be praying in God's will. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 496, Victory in Jesus. Would you please stand? 496, Victory in Jesus.
us pray. Father, we thank you for your victory, for your power, and most of all, your forgiveness and mercy as we go forth in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.